Now we're ready for something new. It's called Minkowski geometry, although you could, uh, you, people do associate the names of Lorentz and Poincaré and Einstein, of course, to this kind of geometry. Um, and what we're going to do is instead of looking at the xy plane, this is just some notational issues, with unit vectors i and j, we're going to replace that. That's the Euclidean situation. And notationally, we're going to be looking at this is the x coordinate, and I'm going to very suggestively label the other coordinate t, even though that has no real significance yet, but it's going to be time, of course, eventually. There's going to be space, there's going to be time, roughly. And uh, e x, e sub x, and e sub t are going to be the unit vectors that we're going to use instead of i and j. Okay, but that's just the notation. What's the what's the real change? The real change is that instead of the dot product, I'm going to be I'm going to even change the notation here because people don't often use the dot for this. I'm going to use angle brackets, and I'm going to define the Minkowski scalar product of u and v. To be very simple, it's just the x-coordinates multiplied together of the two vectors minus the product of the t-coordinates. This is exactly the analog of the dot product, just changing a sign. Okay, So that's going to be the coordinate formula. As I've said before, the coordinate formula is not the main, main thing. We could actually even start sort of more abstractly, but I, I don't want to have to have to tie myself to that abstraction. Okay, So if I have two vectors in Minkowski space, u and v, and say, just as an example, say that's 1, 2, and this is 3, 1, uh, then 1, 2, inner product, or scalar product with 3, 1 is going to be 1 times 3 minus 2 times 1, which happens to be plus 1. Okay. And that minus, it just makes all the difference. Okay, so what I want to do is just jump right into um, the properties of this operation. It's not hard to see that it's still symmetric. That's pretty obvious. And it's still bilinear. Bilinear. But it is absolutely not positive definite. For example, the scalar product of 1, 1 with itself is 1 times 1 minus 1 times 1 is 0. But this is not the 0 vector. And the scalar product, let's say, of 1, 2 with itself is minus 3, which is negative. And that was not supposed to be allowed. And you might think that's just going to completely collapse everything right at the start because one of the very first things we did was we talked about magnitudes, and that was the square root of the dot product of something with itself. Okay, So um, it turns out that it's still useful, though. So the squared length of a vector, the analog of that, is I take a vector v, and I take the dot product, or the Minkowski scalar product of that with itself, and that's going to be uh, the x coordinate squared minus the t coordinate squared. Oh, and by the way, some people switch the entire sign of everything here, but I put the minus on the t coordinate. Okay, um, and we're gonna have we. This is gonna show up so often that we want an even little more compact notation for this. We're gonna call it q of v for the quadratic form. This kind of thing is always called a quadratic form applied to a vector. Okay. Um, and one thing that you can check. I don't think I'm gonna show you is that polarization still works. Polarization had nothing to do with inequalities, positive definiteness. So those polarization identities that I showed you really actually work in this case as well. So in particular, as long as I know q of v for all v, I can recover the scalar product of two different vectors with each other. Okay. So that's a good thing to know. All right. So, so far I've just sort of defined stuff, Have, haven't talked about this issue of what to do with it, but let's go ahead and keep making some definitions. We're going to go ahead and try to totally ignore the fact that this thing is minus just for one more minute. We're going to take the absolute value of that Q of V gadget, 
or in other words, the absolute value of the scalar product of E with itself. And we're going to take the square root of that. Okay, that's called the Minkowski magnitude. It is going to behave quite differently from the ordinary Euclidean magnitude because this is just not the same function. But at least we've taken the absolute value so the square root actually makes sense. Okay, but one of the things that it really, really importantly does is it forgets whether this was positive or negative, this Q of V, and that's going to turn out to be unbelievably important. So this is not the be all and end all. Q of V does, you can recover everything from Q of V, but just knowing this guy has forgotten some very important information. Okay, um, angles, as I said before, we're going to have to save that for later. It really, uh, there's a lot we can do without talking about angles explicitly, but it's it's really cool. Okay, but um, we still use this convention that we say that u is orthogonal to v. We're now going to make that a definition. It used to be something where Euclidean geometry comes with its notion of perpendicularity, and then you look at the dot product and you can prove that saying that two vectors are orthogonal only when the dot product is zero really makes sense. Well, now we're going to use that as a definition. So that when the Minkowski scalar product of u and v is equal to zero, we're going to say that's a definition that u and v are orthogonal. And that's going to have some very interesting consequences as to the pictures and the geometry and eventually the physics. Okay, um, So that's sort of what's similar, but we really have to dive back into this issue of it not being positive definite and there being some interesting signs. Okay, So let me give you a definition. Um, a vector v in Minkowski space is called time-like, and again there's a nice physics notation, if, and again this is according to my sign convention that I get from uh, Wheeler for example, so it comes from a good provenance, if that, if the scalar product of itself, of the v with itself, q of v, is negative, okay? Uh, v is called space-like, if q of v is positive and v is null or to be use an even more suggestive word light like if q of v is equal to zero and usually we say but the vector v not equal to zero we know that zero scalar product with itself is going to be zero. But the interesting thing is that there's these other guys, like for example, 1, 1. We saw that that's an example of a null vector. And for example, up here, 1, 2 was an example of a time-like vector. Not hard to see that, for example, 2, comma 1 is going to be an example of a space-like vector. Okay. So what's the picture here? It's really pretty easy. Um, this is, this, you know, it's just a, a very simple quadratic function of two variables. This is just vx squared minus vt squared, and we're either looking at where it's negative, zero, or positive. Well, let's look at the equality first. vx squared equals vt squared. That's just where vx is plus or minus vt. Okay, so here's my axes, x and t axes. And that's just going to be these dotted lines. And almost all of the pictures I draw, even ones where I actually don't want to draw coordinate axes, and there are going to be a fair number of those, I'm going to be drawing these because this is a very important set. These are the set of null or light-like vectors. And you might guess what's going to be traveling along those lines fairly soon. Okay. Um, and then one thing we notice right away is that the set of... Um, Time-like vectors has two pieces. The ones where t is positive, ones where t is negative. Turns out we're going to call this the future time-like vectors, and these are the past time-like vectors. Oh, you can't really see the word past there, can you? Uh, I don't have quite the all my. There we go. Okay. Now you might think uh, it's really important that the x seems to be divided into two pieces as well. Here's one of the few places where I want to actually talk about higher dimensions. If you had x and y, for example, it would be like vx squared plus vy squared minus vt squared for the, for the uh, Minkowski, the, the quadratic form, the squared magnitude, essentially. Um, 
And if you look at where that's zero, in three dimensions, it forms a cone. And the cone, the inside, the part where the VT is positive or negative, that's really two pieces. The rest of it actually is connected. And even in, and in four dimensions, three space and one time, the, the space-like vectors are connected. The time-like vectors really do fall into two pieces. That should make sense. There's no such thing as like um, super special direction in, in, in space that corresponds to like future and past. But in time, we know there's this huge distinction in our universe between future and past. And so that's, it's from a very simple sort of topological fact that comes out of this algebra um, that there's a future and a past. Okay, so future time like just means something that uh, is has negative Q of V and where the VT is positive, and similarly for past where VT is negative. Okay, so um, let's look just a little bit more at the geometry. One of the things that we talked about, I talked about very briefly, reviewed uh, about Euclidean geometry. This blue pen just leaves such a mess. I'm going to switch back to green and then I'll clean it for next time. Um, unit vectors. Okay, what's a unit vector? Well, a time-like unit vector is going to be where Q of V is minus 1, because then you take the absolute value of that, and it's going to be 1. That's a unit vector. Okay, so a time-like unit vector is where Q of V is minus 1. So that's where Vx squared minus Vt squared is minus 1. Hey, that's a hyperbola. I'm just going to change the sign on everything. It opens in the t direction. So I'm going to put my dotted lines in, because that was where the, where the 0, the null vectors were. And it's exactly a hyperbola with those as the, um, so it's all these vectors go down like this. There's going to be future time-like unit vectors and some past pointing time-like unit vectors. So it's just a, um, a hyperbola, again, with the null, what this is called the null cone. And again, it, it should be called the, the null x, just like a letter x in two dimensions. But um, in higher dimensions, it really is a geometric cone. And this is just kind of a degenerate cone. So the null cone is the null vectors, and those are the asymptotes of this hyperbola of time-like uh, unit vectors. The space-like unit vectors, I'm going to use a different color. Space-like unit vectors are just going to be where uh, that Q of V, which is this, is plus 1. That's just the conjugate hyperbola opening in the x direction. So they're going to be in the space-like set. Okay, so that's cool. Um, one, There's a couple of really important things, though. The set of unit vectors for Euclidean geometry is connected and bounded. It's a circle. Whereas each of this, these sets, first of all, there's, there's two qualitative things. You have to first say, am I talking time-like or space-like? And even when you fix that, each of the, this still has two pieces. Now, the space-like unit vectors in higher dimensions, those do become connected, just like the whole set of all space-like things. This becomes a hyperboloid of one sheet. This becomes a hyperboloid of two sheets. Okay, But time-like is definitely two pieces. And they're all, um, non they're all unbounded. They all go off to infinity. And so there's some definitely topological differences here. OK. So let's finish it up by looking at orthogonality. OK. So let's suppose I have a fixed vector v, which is uh, vx, vt. And I want to find out what vectors w are orthogonal. So that's, we define that to be this equals 0. So I made that definition, but we really want to get a picture. I want to get some intuition for this. OK. Well, let's just write it out. OK. That's Vx Wx minus Vt Wt equals 0. Well, because that's 0, I can do some nice algebra there. I can just move everything around. And it's going to say that Vt over Vx, that's the slope of the V vector as, ri as written is equal to wx over wt, or in other words, that's 1 over the slope of the w vector. That's a, that's a division bar. OK, so what does that mean in terms of the picture?
it means that here's my null cone that if this is v then as we'd expect w is perpendicular to that v but as this slope gets smaller um, then this is the reciprocal slope. It's not the negative reciprocal. That's the thing we expect for Euclidean geometry. It says the slope of one vector is just exactly the reciprocal of the other, not the negative reciprocal. So if this is another v, let's say v prime, then this would be the w prime that's orthogonal to it. And if this is a v double prime, then this is going to be the w prime, the double prime that's orthogonal to it. And in particular, as this gets closer and closer to the null cone, well, guess what? these guys get closer to each other. And that's because, ooh, you can barely see that, huh? Um, that's because a null vector is orthogonal to itself, okay? A null vector, let's say n, is orthogonal to itself. That's just a definition of that the scalar product of itself with zero, with itself is zero. So that's a weird thing to get used to, that a null vector is orthogonal to itself. Now notice, these two null vectors, if you do the calculation, like if this is one, one, and minus one, one, they're definitely not orthogonal to each other. But this is orthogonal to itself, this is orthogonal to itself, and even though they look in the picture, if you use our Euclidean intuition, they look orthogonal to each other, they are not. Um, if you go this way, like if this was v, let's say that's v uh, triple prime, then this guy opens up this way. You can convince yourself that's a negative slope getting lower, so this is, should be also a negative slope, but getting steeper. That would be the, the perp for that one. So you've got this weird thing. One, one way to think about it is you start out with the null vector being orthogonal to itself, and as you open up and go away from the null vector in one direction, it's perpendicular, goes exactly the same apparent angle away from the null vector it's, uh, um, in the other direction until this guy is perpendicular to itself and perpendicular to the opposite vector. So um, remember, we're drawing this picture in a Euclidean in a, in a physical piece of whiteboard, and it's hard not to use our Euclidean intuitions. And sometimes we even want to th say things, like I just said, like the apparent angle is equal. So the angle of V to the null is the same as the angle of W to the null. That's a true fact. But don't think that that's a m super meaningful angle in Minkowski geometry. Okay. Um, okay. So one last little thing, so I don't have to tie up a loose end. Um, that's going to be important. So for example, if I take u dot itself, if it's a time-like vector, that's going to be negative. Not too hard to believe that u dot v, if they are both time-like and both future pointing, so these are generally in the same direction, then u, sorry, the scalar product, that's still going to be negative. Okay. Now if we flip v down here, let's say w, so I have a time, two time-like vectors that are in opposite time cones, then it's actually going to be greater than zero. Now, that's rather different. If I take two space-like vectors that are pretty close to each other, call these A and B, then A and B, they're close to the situation where I'm taking a space-like vector and taking the scalar product of that with itself, and so that's going to be greater than zero. So remember, time-like vectors just have this weird thing about wh the way the signs work that's, of course, opposite to our intuition for signs for dot products. So we're going to have to uh, use that from time to time. Good place to stop, though.